Oh, hi. This week, I'm gonna show you how I make my little plastic charmy guys. Because I've been making them for years for a multitude of purposes, and then it only occurred to me while I was doing a live stream the other day. Thank you for everybody that joined. It was super fun. I've been enjoying getting back into them. So I hope that is mutual, because I'll plan another one for sometime in March. And yeah, I was talking about using these big lobster claw clasps to make myself some stitch markers, and then make some like little plastic charms to go onto it. And I've, I've made that for people before, but I've I've never posted anything about it. So the time has come. And one of y'all asked how I go about making them on the Cricut, where I have done a video on like shrink plastic entirely by hand, but this is a little bit of a different animal. I mean, as far as getting like the plastic shapes and everything, it's a little more involved, but you can do batches of stuff that are duplicates and just get cleaner cuts. You can get interior cuts done this way. Also, hi, I don't know that my machine is supposed to cut this material out. So I don't know if I'm like voiding any warranties or anything. I also have an older model. It's a Cricut Explorer 1, not even an Explorer Air, but an Explorer 1. Don't hold me accountable if something happens with your machine. I'm just letting you know what I have done and it has worked. All right. We're gonna do a fairly easy design just to just to keep things kind of simple, but I will show you examples of more complicated things that I've done where we're just gonna draw a little shroomy. I get really irritated when my lines aren't like smooth curves and then it occurred to me I can just use the curve tool to do these things. Don't work smarter, work hard. No, see? That's how I operate, where I should be working smarter, not harder. <laughs> so yeah, I just went into this free design program that came with a tablet I got years ago for 40 bucks. It came with like three different drawing programs. This one is called Clip Studio Paint. But obviously if you have Procreate or something like that, you can go for that as well. Now obviously the designing process is all gonna be via the Cricut. So if you don't have one, understandable if you don't hang out for the whole video. But I do try shrinking them down with a heat gun and show like how I went about painting these with multiple colors, which I've never done before. If you want to watch that, you can like skip past the designing process and go to the part where I use dangerous power tools. <laughs> as far as the design goes, I try to be mindful of no super, super tiny areas that are definitely going to break off pretty easily because I want these to be fairly durable. I mean, it's still jewelry and jewelry tends to be like on the daintier side. So it's not like they have to be heavy duty industrial pieces, but I have made designs that were not created with this in mind and they broke like immediately. Specifically the part where I need to add in some type of loop or like a hole in the top of the charm where the jump ring is going to go or wherever I'm going to be attaching something else. So I want these charms to dangle down as either earrings or a pendant on a necklace. Certain designs lend themselves to having a hole in the actual design, but this one I'm adding to the top because I just think it'll look better this way. And I am going back and reinforcing it, like thickening that line up just to make super sure this isn't going to break. I'm making these a little bit bigger. When I've made them in the past, I've started out with a piece that's about two inches, two and a half maybe, and it shrinks down about 50%. So like little teeny guys, but I don't know why I decided on the number four, but I went with four inches for the biggest metric. So like if it's a taller piece, not super wide. I went with four inches tall. If it's a wider piece that's not very tall, then I went with four inches wide. No matter how you flip it, the biggest it's going to be at any angle is four inches. So the final result ended up being about two inches. So just keep that in mind. You're going to basically have to double the end result size when you are cutting out the shrink plastic to start with. Once this little shroomy was drawn, I made sure I cleaned up any lines. I did mirror the images so that it was completely symmetrical on both sides where you don't have to do that with your designs. I do have some clouds that are asymmetrical, so that's not essential to creating these. It's just what I was going for for this project. So I just saved it as either a JPEG or a PNG. I don't think it matters, but some type of, I don't know, photo file. I don't know anything about computer stuff, so if there's specific terms for things that I am not adding in here, it's because I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Again, walking you through how I go about it, and it seems to work out okay for me. Then I import it into the Cricut Design Space, and this is a super easy one to clear out the negative space around the design. You just click it and it takes all of it out. And then obviously the inside of the hole for the jump ring to go through. If you have any other interior things that need to be taken out, if there's a facing 
and you need to take the eyes out or there's a mouth you want an opening for or anything, anything. I have TARDIS jewelry where I've drawn little hearts in the middle, so those also need to get removed in this part of the process. Then it's just putting it into the design space itself. As a cut image, you don't need to do the cut and print because we're just getting the shape out of this and we're not actually like printing anything out. Put it in, it starts out absolutely massive, so I shrink it down to four inches tall and then I duplicate it a bunch of times. I usually end up doing it more times than necessary because the way Cricut lays out stuff as their default is not particularly frugal with the material, and I'm sure that is on purpose because I feel like there are so many other ways that you can lay stuff out that uses the material more efficiently. I always end up going in and flipping stuff around, so if I were going off of their layout that they gave me to start with, I would only be able to fit four of these in the space that I need it to fit into with the sheet of plastic I'm using. Oh, also, as far as the plastic goes, I often use recycled material. This little strip here is, I believe, from like a cornbread container that I had at some point. I obviously wash it out and then I take sandpaper to one of the sides and rough it up just so it's not a completely smooth surface on one side so that whatever color you're adding to it is more likely to stick. Colored pencils basically won't work unless you have one of the sides roughed up. When I don't have enough of the recycled material to use, I have ordered a pack of shrink film sheets. This is by the brand Graphics, not sponsored or anything, it's just what I've used. It's pretty consistently shrinks 50%. I know not everything shrinks the same ratio, so definitely look at your material. Obviously when you're using recycled material, you have no idea. And when I say recycled material, I mean any number six plastic. So you know there's like that little triangle with the little arrows. It'll have a number in the middle of whatever the plastic is. If it says number six, you should be good. Often take out containers, things like that. Like it's kind of flimsy plastic. Use what you can. I am all about turning trash into treasure. So I have spent a lot of time hoarding other people's leftovers containers from restaurants for this exact purpose. <laughs> As I will be cutting out a lot of these, I'm gonna use one of the full sheets and it's standard paper size, eight and a half inches by 11. Again, their layout, I can only fit four. After my noodling around and re-angling things, I more than doubled the amount of pieces I could get out of this. So once I rearranged things, I was able to get nine out of there. Now the way I cheat this to fit more stuff onto there is, I use a 12 by 12 mat and put this eight and a half by 11 sheet on top of the mat. But if it's asking what size mat I have, I will select 12 by 24. So on the working mat page layout thing, it'll have way more of the pieces so you can cram more into there. You can't like transfer stuff up from a separate mat to get on to the first one. So I just flat out lie to the machine and tell it I'm using a bigger one so I can fit more on. And then if you do have extras that aren't fitting in the space, don't panic, you don't have to restart. All you have to do is hit these like three little dots on the corner and hit hide selected image or something, hide selected, hide selection you can hide it so that it's just not gonna be on the page at all. Would have only been four, I ended up getting nine. I definitely think that's worth the extra time that this takes to move stuff around, where it's both cost effective and also just wasting less plastic. Okay, once I have the layout sorted, I move on to the next screen. Oh, and rather than the regular mat that's for like standard paper and stuff, I get the fabric grip mat. It's like pretty heavy duty. I think there's like a extra strong mat you can get as well that's similar stickiness. You can also obviously tape things down and that's gonna help as it loses its adhesiveness because just the fact you're taking stuff on and off of these sticky sheets, it's gonna get less sticky the more you use it. So yeah, I go with the fabric grip mat and I use the deep cut blade instead of the regular standard size blade. And then there's been a myriad of updates on this program over the years. Some are frustrating, some are great. One of those better ones is that they have a lot more preset options because I used to just have to make my own custom thing and it was super annoying to try to figure out because there's so many different settings you can apply. But what I pick to do the plastic sheets is the foil acetate setting. There's an option for the pressure and there's like standard or normal and then more or less. So I select more pressure. So it's gonna push that a little bit harder. And then yeah, I just hit the edit tools button and switch to the deep cut blade. Obviously feel free to make adjustments as you want to the settings. I think this setting, the foil acetate, it does two passes 
of the cuts, but at least in previous updates, you were able to do up to six passes. And that's definitely what I had to bump it up to once my blade was like starting to dull and the mat was starting to get a little less sticky. Another update I'm very on board for is that now it seems that it makes a point to cut the internal bits before it does the main border cuts because what was happening before is it would just do whatever the hell it wanted. So if I was on like the last pass of cutting these pieces of plastic out and it did the border cut first, when it went in to do the interior cut, it would like pull it off of the mat and move it around and just destroy everything essentially where it doing the internal cuts first there's more structure to everything going on. So then when it does the border cut after, if things loosen up at that point, it's fine because the internal cuts have been done. I'm just very thankful it will do the inside cut before cutting out the whole piece because it was just causing a million nightmares and there was no way to adjust that. Okay, and then I have cut enough out with this new blade that I got that it's starting to dull enough that I need to have the program run the whole cycle one more time. So it did the two passes on everything with this first round. Now I'm gonna have it do a second round so it'll do a third and fourth pass. And if you wanna do this, if it didn't cut out stuff enough and you need it to go over it again, do not eject the mat. When it finishes and you see that it needs more work, just hit the cricket button, hit the go button again. Do not eject the mat or it's gonna not line up the same and it will ruin everything you have just done. I have been burned every time I've tried to do that. So if you keep it inserted the same way it was for the first pass and you don't inject it and you just hit the go button, it will do a second pass on the exact same path it did before and just cut along the exact same lines without shifting anything around. It is great. I love that this is an option. And okay, if you wanna know one of the things that I have been frustrated with as far as updates is when I logged into the Cricut Design Space, you may have noticed that it said, hi, Cheryl, that is not my name because if you have a non-subscription account, like you buy the machine, you download the program, you use it. You can pay for a subscription to Cricut. I don't remember what it's called, but if you don't have the subscription, they limit how many images you can import into the program, which is bananas because I have paid for the machine. I shouldn't have to also pay for the program to use the machine. I just hate that that seems to be the way of technological things. Buying the actual equipment isn't enough. You have to pay for additional things on a monthly basis and it's just very frustrating. Charge me a little bit extra when I buy the machine to cover the cost of the program, which I'm sure they're doing to start with, and then just leave me alone. Let me do my thing. They also just don't let you use Cricut Design Space with the older machines. I went on a big old rant about that a couple years ago when I first started using Cricut machines. We don't have to go all the way down that rabbit hole again, but just if you're new here, that that is not something I'm a fan of. So yeah, just so I don't have to worry about my own image limit, my dear fairy god Cheryl is letting me use up hers essentially. So very thankful for that. Would not be able to make all of these as like willy-nilly. I'd have to be way more conscientious about the things I'm importing, if not for that. So thank you. As always, Cheryl, you are the nicest. Anyway, back to the project at hand that is going well. After this second round of cuts, it looks like it did enough to actually separate the little shroomies from the rest of the plastic sheet. I've tried to make it work when it's like almost scored versus actually cut out and like gone over it with an X-Acto knife, but there's so much physical effort you have to put in. I have like hurt my hands and shoulders doing that. It is so tedious and there's so much more room for error with that. Super flimsy material and like brittle. So if you even look at it the wrong way sometimes, it'll like split apart. And it's super gutting when you put all this time into going back over all of these specific lines and then there's just one spot that like you cut a little bit too far or when you go to pop out the bit that was scored and you're like putting pressure on it, it just splits the whole thing in half. I would rather have the cricket go over it again, save myself the time and headache and like muscle pain so that I have an easier time and a higher success rate because I basically build into me making these that some of them are gonna fail. Not everything that I make in a batch is gonna make it all the way to the end, but I have a higher number of successful pieces all the way to the end of the process when I, I let it cut more things out. Also, did you know you can sharpen your blade? I mean, obviously clean it off as you're going because there will be little bits of plastic that kind of build up everywhere. So like each time you cut a sheet, just take the blade out and like at least blow it off and make sure there's not a ton of buildup in your machine. But if you take like a ball of aluminum foil, obviously be careful so you don't end up stabbing your own hand, but you can push the needle, not needle, blade, 
there we go we're not sewing things today you can push it in and it'll help sharpen it a little bit more I've heard you can like cut aluminum foil with scissors and that helps sharpen it I don't understand how this works but I have seen a little bit of improvement with it so if you need like a little bit more life back in your blade that might be able to help and yeah if your mat is starting to lose its adhesiveness there is a window where like if you just put washi tape around the borders to hold the material down especially now that it is cutting out the interior pieces before the edge of the entire piece that you're cutting out if there's not a ton of stickiness that's going to be less of an issue now so you can get more life out of the mats and the blades and and the material and everything including yourself <laughs> when I go to peel this stuff off I do like to just get the main piece like the excess scrap border bits of the whole sheet off first and then I will start picking up either with my nails which gets annoying and painful after a while or some type of spatula thing my mat is losing its stickiness enough that I can just bend the mat a bit and it'll help me peel the piece off when I first use this brand new mat I had to use this little point turner thing to like really get underneath and detach the plastic from the sticky sheet because it just wanted to hang on there and I know Cricut sells like spatula tools and there are you can use a credit card to do this like an old credit card don't use a current credit card but something that'll just get under the edge and peel it up because I don't own any of the like Cricut brand tools that you can get for the machine but I have not heard great reviews as far as the quality so whatever you have is gonna be fine it doesn't have to be the branded tools hell the dollar store has some options that are probably just as good okay yeah once I got all of the bits off of the mat I gave everything a once over made sure things weren't torn because this part in particular is where it's really easy to break your pieces and not have them come out right and have tears and everything so if there's an interior piece, like the inside of the jump ring hole that I made. If that piece didn't come out when I was peeling it off of the mat, I'll just carefully like push it through and try to pull it out if it's stuck somewhere. Like if there's one little hang up that didn't cut all the way through. All right, and as I said, I have cut out some more complicated designs. I had actually dropped one on the floor during all of this that I was gonna show y'all, but then couldn't find it because here's the thing. These are all clear plastic, so when one goes missing, it's very hard to find. But I did a very tedious, very tedious drawing of a windmill that I will be painting red because Moulin Rouge trash is me. Hi. And yeah, I want like a little necklace that I can wear that looks like this. But you see how much detail there is going on here? It's wild. And I used to have stuff like this. I would go over each of these little squares with an X-Acto blade and it was a nightmare. Don't do that to yourself. Just let the Cricut do more cuts. It'll be fine. So yeah, you can be as basic or as intricate as you want, baby. So I think the traditional way to do any like shrinky dink art is to use colored pencils. And yes, the sheets of graphics plastic that I got says it's pre-sanded and it is pre-roughed up on one side but it's not enough for the color pencil to really work so you can see I'm struggling to get any color to stay on this little cloud that I have so color pencils are safe to do before you bake these or heat them up however you're shrinking them sharpies are also non-toxic we're like I don't want to do it with paint or nail polish acrylic and plasticky and I don't know what it would do in the oven I feel like it'd at least bubble and look like absolute trash otherwise so if you're doing sharpie color pencil you can do those beforehand otherwise I'm just gonna wait to color the rest of these after they have shrunk because I'm gonna paint them or use nail polish use some other method of coloring now if the color pencil isn't sticking all I would have had to do is just take some sandpaper and rough it up some more it would have been fine but I don't want to have to do that for all of these so I didn't I improvised with a sharpie I found I was hoping to find my silver one I don't know where it is I don't know if metallic ones are safe to bake in the oven after you've colored it in so don't quote me on that if you know please comment with that information because that would be helpful to know I feel like this kind of project in particular is like rogue crafting like you're not really supposed to use your Cricut to cut this stuff out it's not one of the like approved materials and then I feel like sticking certain things in the oven that you're not really supposed to stick in the oven is also like a little renegade action you know anyway the gray sharpie I used I hated how it was coming out so then I went to like wipe some off and the way I smudged it I thought looked very cool so I did these little swirls around and got it to look like a big dark storm cloud so I went from absolutely hating it to kind of loving it once I got on this color smudging train 
I decided that the water droplets, the raindrops that I made for these cloud earrings, that's why there are little holes along the bottom of the cloud, it would be cool to get a more watery effect to use a watercolor marker, like a water-based marker, like a Crayola marker or something like that. Get out of here with your rose art. Color it in. It's not gonna stick very well. Wipe it off with my fingers so it's almost just stained. I really liked how that came out. It was just super fun making a mess. And yes, this got my fingers very dirty and messy and I had an absolute blast. I haven't made a mess like this and just futzed around with things in so long. And this wasn't even the main part of the messiness. That's gonna come after this next step, which was it's time to shrink. So I have exclusively used the oven in previous attempts where I just turn it on at 350 and it takes a minute and a half, maybe two minutes, something like that. It goes really fast. I just stay and I watch. I put the oven light on and I watch through the window. Keep an eye on it that way because if you leave them in too long, at least for me, they've gotten this like crackling effect that I really don't like. I'm sure it will be good in some situations, but it's never been something I was aiming for and it has bummed me out every time it's happened. So we're going to try another method. I was given this heat gun. This is a Milwaukee brand one. I know that there are more like craft specific little handheld ones. It almost looks like a 3D printing pen and I know those blow air. I don't know if they get as hot as this thing does and it does blow a little bit of air. It's not super pressurized though. It's not like a hair dryer or something. Though I wonder if a hair dryer can get hot enough to do this as well. I wonder like what the sweet spot temperature is for doing this. So I tried to make sure I had a safe surface to shrink these on. So I got this big like wooden stand. I then put a Teflon sheet over it. This is one I use for ironing stuff. It just absorbs the heat really well and it just seemed like it would be less likely to damage anything underneath. I just didn't want to set my studio on fire. That was the goal here. So this is actually the same piece I used in the last batch of earrings I made, which were these little broken heart charms. And I did bake these in the oven and it came out great. I don't think I lost any soldiers with this batch, which was very nice feeling because when it shrinks up, there's a moment of panic where either it's going to stay stuck forever or it's going to curl up into itself and then the magical part, which happened so quickly with the heat gun, is when it just flattens itself out and is smaller. Like, so cool. I do find that when they are baked in the oven, if I have a pocket of parchment paper and I have the charms like between the two layers, it is less likely that a particularly long piece will be irreversibly curled up onto itself because it has like the little bit of protection from the top to kind of keep it more flat to start with. But obviously an oven is more evenly heated than me holding a heat gun and I, it just wasn't working. I thought I had completely ruined the charm that I tried to melt down this way because I, I warped it in a way I was not expecting it to be able to recover from. But number six plastic is magical. Almost all the things I messed up with I was able to fix. I think there's only one that I lost for good. Oh I used hemostats where you can use like some kind of metal something. Maybe a, I don't know, wood makes me nervous because that can burn. Although metal conducts heat so I had to be really careful about what part of the hemostats I was touching. Perhaps some like all metal pliers maybe would be helpful but just to have something in one of the bits of negative interior space because it's blowing air. So it's gonna like flip around and everything. I didn't want it flying off into the abyss that is the corner of my shop where, um, you know what, we just don't have to talk about it. And I found that very helpful to just keep it in one spot. It was great. You'll be able to figure something out, I'm sure. And yeah, the other upside of using the heat gun is you can aim it at a specific section where in the oven it's just kind of everything gets shrunk and if something's warped there's not like a lot of finessing you can do with it. So going in with the heat gun if there's one part that definitely needed a little bit more heat but you didn't want to like melt the other side you can aim it like super directional. It was great. I, I really enjoyed using the heat gun. Obviously it's more physically intensive than doing the oven and I'd say it's probably like equal time because it went quicker but you kind of have to do them individually where in the oven you can do batches but not that many because they start out so big you can only fit so many on the sheet pan where obviously like they shrink down a lot smaller but the starting size you can only fit a handful of things on there at the beginning. Oh my knee is making an upsetting noise. I'm having like a not great pain day particularly with one of my knees and uh it, I can feel that it wants to pop. 
You know when you have like a lot of pressure in one of your fingers and like, you know, if you pop it, it'll feel better. That happens with my knee sometimes or like my elbow feels like it almost gets stuck when I try to put it out and I just gotta like work it a bit and then it'll pop. I don't know what causes it. I don't know if I'm making things worse for myself by doing this, but it's just how I exist in the world. Oh, it popped. Oh my God. But yeah, as far as this being my very first time using this tool, I am very pleased with how well it went. And it actually makes me look forward to experimenting with individual designs going forward and kind of doing more test run stuff because I don't feel like I have to do a whole batch in the oven. And also I understand if someone doesn't want me baking little pieces of plastic in the oven we use to cook food in, where I know people have like a craft toaster oven for their polymer clay and shrink plastic stuff. And I've definitely considered that. I don't have space in here at the moment. So heat gun is gonna do the trick. And I'm just so glad it's something I've never fussed around with before and it actually went well. All right, now that all of these are shrunk down, it is time to do the other phase of coloring stuff in. So specifically with the mushrooms, I wanted to try layering some color. I've only ever done one single color on things before. Any jewelry you've ever seen in my shop prior to this has been done with one single color. Unless I was doing like with colored pencils, kind of getting a swirl effect. I know I made these jellyfish that I used, you know, pinks and blues and purples and grays and did just like a bunch of different colors on the body of the jellyfish. And I had a bunch of holes on the bottom them, so there were little chains hanging down so those look like the little tendrils. I would like to make more of those and definitely just like a slightly bigger size but I know I'm gonna have to sand down the plastic to start with and it just it felt a little too involved for what I was doing today. But if you're interested I will definitely add those to the list of things that I should make for my shop. <laughs> also by the way I have an event this weekend it's in Lowell Massachusetts on Saturday the 11th of February from 1 to 4 p.m. It's the Love Buzz Market and I will have all of these for sale there. This is like why I'm making all of this jewelry. It'll end up in my Etsy shop after, but I figured do a little toadstool mushroom. We'll get red and white. We can manage this and it's an organic thing. So it's okay if things aren't exactly perfect. And yeah, I took a Posca pen, like a paint pen, and I drew on some circles for the spots on the top of the toadstool. There's the shiny side and the rough side of the little plastic piece. I'm doing this on the rough side because I think of the shiny side as like the face of it. And I was trying to think, right, if I'm doing red as the main color, I'm gonna paint across the entire head of this mushroom. I need the white to be on first so that when you look at it from the front, you will see the white spots with the red behind it. So I did two coats of the white Posca pen just to get it like pretty opaque because I didn't want it turning pink when I went over it with the red. So I let that dry after both coats. I did the Posca pen with white nail polish behind it for the stem. And then yeah, like I said, did the head of the toadstool with red nail polish behind that. Did a couple of coats. So again, it didn't look pinky. I wanted this to be like punchy red. And to be honest, I am beyond excited about how this came out where, you know, the goal is not to make these look like they're not handmade, but I still want them to look nice. And I think that this is very effective. I had a plan and it ended up working and I'm really, really excited about it. This was a test shape that I did was this calcifer. Now what happened is I took a pen and drew two circles for his eyes and then drew the mouth shape. And then I did just a tiny dot of black nail polish for the pupils. Where I literally took the head of a sewing pin and did a tiny little dot with black nail polish. And then I used that same sewing pin to cover his mouth with the nail polish. So the rest of it was with an orange Sharpie and it looked okay. And then yeah, once the black nail polish was dry, I put white behind it. So again, like kind of layering stuff, knowing that you're gonna be looking at it from the shiny side. What happened is however I went about the next layer of color, I didn't like. So then I took a paper towel and tried to like wipe off the wet nail polish. So the red that I tried to clean up, it had almost this like crackling effect behind it. So then I put yellow behind that. And that's how I got this really cool effect that like it kind of looks like a fire. It was completely unintentional, but so pleased with how it came out. And this is where I made a giant mess coloring all of these in. And I had so much fun because I haven't made a mess like that for the sake of like trying out different designs and coloring stuff in and just noodling around. It was like free jazz, you know? And it just felt good. It felt good to get my hands covered in a multitude of like markers and paint and nail polish. Oh, and speaking of intricate ones, this is a slightly more complicated one I did. So I took a sewing pin, black nail polish, 
tried to make these lines. I did buy like a fine line paint pen to do this a little more neatly because I don't love how it came out. It's based on the Hellfire Club shirts from Stranger Things and my imagination about that shirt becoming a design is like Eddie Munson drew that himself so it's okay that it doesn't look perfectly neat because he's not a perfectly neat kind of guy. So yeah I put the black lines down first and then painted the yellow behind that. I also managed to get some yellow like on the inside like the edge. I did some black in the nose and then yellow at the eyes because I wanted it to be cut out there but also the image on the shirt it has yellow eyes so I really like how that effect came out. Did that first because any yellow that got on the back or front like the shiny side or the roughed up side which was kind of inevitable I just wiped off with a q-tip that had a little bit of nail polish remover on it and cleaned that up so that it just showed up on the edges and then I added the red so it was a really fun way to go about it. As far as this being part hey I've done this a bunch of times let me show you how I do it and also part experimental with how I colored in some of the things I am really happy with the batch of stuff that I made and because I feel like my description of this was not very good this is what I was going for with the cloud and the raindrops I have these three holes on the bottom and I actually did most of the charms this way I did kind of like a silvery opalescent layer of nail polish and then put white behind it so it kind of graded out a little bit but also sometimes you look at clouds and like the light reflects in a weird way because there's so much moisture in them but I wanted to have these holes along the bottom so that I could add jump rings and have the raindrop pieces be at different heights if I hung a chain from one or two of them so yeah it's really nice when an idea actually like fully comes together the best part about all of this is I can layer a bunch of pieces like this and it's super lightweight and I like when I basically don't have to think about the fact that I have earrings in if I just sit and they're not actually touching me like I can't feel that they're waving back and forth like this these are based on the earrings that Jean-Pierre Polnareff wears in Jojo's Bizarre Adventure and I really like how the chain comes down because I personally for me with how short my hair is and how long my face is I feel like there's a lot of empty space here and I have a very long neck so having ones that hang down suit me I think. I like how they look. And yeah if you're not into jewelry these can work as like a keychain or if you want to make some little stitch markers and just add them to a lobster clasp. I've actually added charms to some of my bags that I made almost as like a little zipper tab and especially when I have a charm that matches the theme of the bag I just really love that extra personal touch to it so I'm definitely going to be making more charms for my bags like that and honestly maybe even just make some that look like my logo and I think those are all the things I wanted to share this week. If you have any follow-up questions or something I didn't cover that seems like I should have, let me know. And again, thank you Carrie specifically for asking how I go about doing these with the Cricut because I, th I think everyone at some point in their life has done regular hand cut shrink plastic stuff and then just using like a hole punch to make the hole for the jump ring to go into. But this specific type of project is why I got the Cricut in the first place. I only just tried making stickers a couple days ago and it went like okay. Also can we talk about the little Burt art that I made? I actually made new headers for every tier over on my Patreon which hi if you're new here the reason these videos even get to happen is because of everyone over on Patreon. They support me in a way that I get to dedicate the time and resources to doing this in the first place. Thank you everybody over there for letting me do the dang thing. But yeah, I've never had header art on any of the tiers before, but this past week, Rachel Maxey launched her Patreon and I made sure like that morning to go over and sign up for her she, just singular membership tier that she has. It's just $5 and that's the only option, which if I was a creator of her size, I think I would also do that just to have like one blanket low amount tier for everybody. But I have six tiers and to be completely honest the lower ones are you know you get a shout out on here at the end of every video and I'll either post an exclusive video over on patreon for the month or do a live stream but I'm able to set aside the time to do those things because of the support over there where it takes a lot for me to put a video out like I don't I don't know if that actually comes across because I feel like sometimes I make it look like I'm just doing whatever I don't even care I care very hard and I put a lot of time into this every single week and yeah I don't know something about seeing her patreon page and she does have header art for like the one tier it made me want to stop working on the time sensitive stuff that I had and spend I don't know half of a day working on little Burt arts so these are just a little like peek at them 
you don't need to donate to it to see the artwork, but if you want to see some cute little birds doing some little different things, I'm very proud of how it all came out. So if you just want to like look at the Patreon page just to scroll through and see the little bird art, I'm very proud of how it all came out. I love that little idiot so much. And I'm glad that all of y'all were as excited about the Burt Fest last week as I was because it has maybe been my favorite thing I've made. And I feel like I've said that about every project I've done so far this year, but it just keeps getting better. And I definitely want to make Burt something else. I don't know what to do though. I think maybe some kind of bed because I have some foam and I've made him like a little Hagrid's hut before but I just have a really hard time finding any joy in Harry Potter or anything anymore. So if, if you wanna help me come up with something else I can make him, that would be really fun to brainstorm together. All right, on that note, I'm gonna go. I have so much prep to finish doing and with my knee hurting how it is, it'll be good to sit and edit this and like keep my leg up for a bit take a break from this and then I can come back to it once the swelling has subsided. Because in addition to making stuff for the market this weekend, um, I then also have to work the market this weekend. So I need to make sure I'm like physically okay enough to handle it. I love feeling super high maintenance. It's my favorite thing. Anyway, I will see you back here with another video next Friday. Thank you so much for hanging out. All right, can we talk about the world's best thumb ring? I did another market this past weekend and my friend Jen that runs Stamped Metal Co or Stamped Metals Co, I'll put it here if you want to check it out. She made these little rings out of spoons and this one we kept calling it the Haunted Baby Spoon and uh, it fit. Apparently I have a ring size 8 for my thumb and I have never been more excited about anything with a with a wee one on it. It's equal parts joyous and unsettling. So I'm on board with both mess and messes. What am I trying to say?